So welcome to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Land Access for Beginning Farmers Part 2. I'm Jesse Schmidt. I help coordinate the New Farmer Project for UVM Extension. Um, the focus of this presentation is the many variables that should be considered when assessing farms, land, and farm infrastructure for a rental or purchase. Our presenters this evening are Ben Waterman and Kathy Roof. Ben Waterman coordinates the land access program at the Center for Sustainable Agriculture and provides free consulting services to landowners and farmers on natural resource management, uh, farm enterprise startup, farmland conservation, land use regulations, and farm tenure. Uh, ben works closely with UVM Extension's New Farmer Project to develop our educational resources for small farmers in the startup stages of their business. Kathy Roof is co-director for um, of Land for Good, a New England nonprofit that specializes in working land access or, or some, blah, sorry, um, specializes in working on land access and farm succession. Uh, she's worked for over two decades on beginning farmer and farmland tenure issues. She also coordinates the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group. So uh, welcome, Ben and Kathy. Thanks, Jesse. And I welcome everyone to part two of this webinar series. Uh, Kathy and I will be presenting, although I, I, I have the, the majority of um, time on the floor for this part of the webinar series. Uh, but Kathy will chime in uh, when, as needed, or, or whenever um, you feel the need, Kathy, feel free to chime in. Um, and before we start, I'm just curious again, where is everyone from? Uh, if you could enter into the chat box just just the state that you are from once again, that would be really helpful. Give everyone a, a chance to practice using the chat box there. OK. Can everyone hear me? No one's no one's entering anything into the chat box here, so um, use this uh, smiley face if you can hear me. Great. So let's let's try it this way then. Um, use the smiley face again if you're if you're farming in Vermont or if you live in Vermont. And how about New Hampshire? Good. New York? Massachusetts? A couple people. Rhode Island? Connecticut? Is anyone from anywhere else? Where are you from, Melville? OK. Well, thanks. It's, it's good to know where people are coming from. We'll, we'll try to, to give, it seems like, for the most part, we're all from the Northeast region or, or New England. So we'll try to relay some information that's pertinent to everyone here. Feel free to stop me at any time or enter your questions in the chat box as our, our slides go on. Um, we'd love to, to try to cater this presentation to, to your needs and to your questions. So, so again, feel free to use the chat box. Um, and if we can't get to your questions immediately, we will try to address them as the webinar goes on. So uh, a brief recap of part one of the webinar series. A, a couple weeks ago, Kathy and I went over uh, basic land access concepts. And we went through a wide variety of options that farmers can pursue to acquire land and gain access to it. Uh, and one main take home message from that uh, part one of the webinar series was that you don't have to own land to acquire it. And various lease arrangements and other scenarios uh, can enable you to get onto the land with, without necessarily purchasing it. And uh, Last webinar, we also went through the types of leases and what, what is incorporated in a typical lease. 
And we also touched on a little bit about where to search for farmland. But uh, tonight's webinar will center around readiness concepts and planning and preparing for farm tenure. And we'll also go through assessing particular parcels, um, you know, the tools and resources you can use to learn much more about a particular site that you are interested in. So to get ready, um, does everyone recognize the, the group on the right here? This is, <laughs> this is the Temptations. Um, yeah, initially, I, th I was going to come out and sing their, their song, Get Ready, but I was, I was, uh, Kathy, do, do you want to go ahead and sing that song to get things going here and get ready? No. <laughs> and I guess there's only three of us with a microphone. Jesse, would you like to sing Get Ready? <laughs> All right, well, let me try. All right, here, get ready, because here I come. Twiddly D and twiddly dum. Look out, baby, because here I come. How was it? I'm just trying to get everyone's attention here. So uh, you, you can either uh, clap or use some of these icons if um, you like the little song there. So getting ready for farmland tenure involves various things that we're going to be discussing in the next half hour or 45 minutes uh, before we get into the principles involved in assessing particular properties. So, so briefly, we're going to be talking about uh, determining whether or not land is your limiting factor. We're going to talk about evaluating your needs versus your wants, integrating family values, considering ownership costs. Um, this, this is a big one right here. Um, it's a lot of times beginning farmers underestimate how much it's going to cost them actually to own land or what are the costs involved in actually leasing land. Um, they, needless to say, have enormous implications for moving your farm business forward. And we're going to go through farmland purchase and leasing considerations that can be integrated into a business plan. And we'll also look at if you're looking to acquire a farm through purchase, We'll look at how to prepare for approaching a loan officer or obtaining a loan to do so. So is land acquisition right for you? Um, you know, what, what really is your, your limiting factor in, in, in moving your farm business forward or, or your, or your your family life forward. Um, a lot of times, there are other things that might be holding a, a, a new farmer back, and um, and land might not be on the top of that list. So, there are other typical challenges that are associated with that are that are the, the typical barriers to starting up a farm. It could be lack of production knowledge and skills. It could be you don't have markets that are developed yet. Um, you know, and a huge one is there's not enough time. Um, it's, it's not talked about a lot, but the truth is for a lot of beginning farmers, there's just no time to work on the farm because um, they have to oftentimes work off the farm. So it is, is addressing the land access barrier going to be the first thing that's most important to moving your business forward? And that's, that's the main question. Um, You know, what, um, so if, if, it's, if lack of production knowledge and skills is, is the main barrier, then maybe before looking into acquiring land, um, it's best to, to look into the various apprenticeship programs or even get a job on a farm. Um, so you really hit the ground running once you do acquire land. Um, capital, there's, there's, not, there's not as much as a fine line between lack of capital and lack of, of land. Um, they kind of go hand in hand, but um, you know, oftentimes you can get financing or capital to start a business that's, that's not um, centered on 
the, the land piece. You don't need 40 or 100 or 200 acres of land necessarily to start a business with um, making productive use of, of your assets and capital. And it's needless to say it's really important to filter out your needs from your wants. Um, now this is assuming that that, you're, that you have already identified that your limiting factor is indeed land access, um, or at least it's a major limiting, limiting factor for you. Now, um, what, what type of land or what, what type of, of tenure situation or scenario is going to fulfill your needs um, in terms of, le of um, what, what is li most limiting to you? What type of land do you need, in other words? Um, so this is otherwise known as the minimalist strategy. If you're, you're really focusing on what it is you need out of a property, and it's kind of counterintuitive, but if you can sort of filter down what you actually need out of a property or, or out of a farm tenure situation, it actually opens up more tenure opportunities. That's, that's really counterintuitive. Um, but the fact is that the, the, the real viable opportunities are going to open up to you um, when they're more based on what you need and, and, and they're more based on the scale of business that you're at. So um, in other, other words, there'd be more realistic opportunities available for you if you can really focus on what you need out of a property versus what you want. Everyone wants the, um, the farm property that's on the cover of all the magazines. But uh, could you, are, are you going to be able to manage that type of property when you get onto it? Um, even in, in the long term, is it something that you could grow into? Those are questions that are, are worth asking from the get-go. In terms of garner, garnering support for your farm operation, you might be reaching out to community members for financing. You might be approaching loan officers. Once you do get access to land, you might be reaching out to, to loan officers to extend you a loan. And um, my experience has been that people are much more willing to support an operation that they know is making more out of less than you know they have too much to handle. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. And then, of course, in terms of protecting yourself from unexpected costs, um, there are huge costs associated with owning and in leasing um, more, more land than you need, more land that you can use productively. So in order to protect yourself from that risk, um, it's good to really focus on what, what you need. This is a checklist that's available in Holding Ground, which Kathy had a, a huge part in, in writing. Um, this is a guide to Northeast Farmland Tenure and Stewardship. It's currently available for sale at the New England Small Farms Institute bookstore. And this page uh, is page 31 out of that text. Um, I highly recommend everyone getting a hold of this if they are serious about acquiring land either through lease or purchase or, or alternative, other alternative means. Um, it goes through all sorts of scenarios, all different options in, in, um, in acquiring land. And this is a great checklist that can guide you through some of the considerations that you can make. And I, I, I apologize to everyone because the, the text might not be readable here. Um, but the way Kathy's laid it out here is that you're really you're, you're looking at each of these factors, whether it be location, land base, climate, infrastructure, housing, or the history of the land. Um, and you're, you're assessing for your particular situation whether or not each of these factors is necessary to your, to your farm operation or your, or your, your family ambitions, um, whether or not these factors are desirable or optional. Um, so that, you know, it's really, it's, sometimes it's tough to, go to, to, to keep in your head all of the considerations that, that can be made when looking introspectively um, at your potential for uh, running a, a viable farm op operation once you do acquire land. So this kind of lays everything out in w on one page um, for you to use.
family values is not often considered. People are very excited usually to start farming, to get onto the land. Um, but you really, in some cases, committing to a long-term endeavor, uh, and, and it can be important. Um, you know, this is this is a great pi picture of of a happy family. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure who the farmer would be in this picture, but um, I'm sure the rest of the people would appreciate being close to the farmer. Um, you know, maybe helping out throughout retirement. I know that's the, that's the case. I um, I don't know if Jesse mentioned it in, the, in a small bio when we started out, but I'm trying to establish a small fruits farm, um, and my father has expressed the desire to work on it throughout his retirement. So I'm going to be putting my dad to work, hopefully. Um, but it's hard to do that when you're far away. Needless to say, I mean, there there are complicated issues involved in in figuring out what's best for the entire family. Um, you know, not oftentimes it's not aligned necessarily with what's best for the farm business, but uh, it's it's definitely good to to keep in mind um, that that things might be in balance. I've heard a lot from farmers who are established and say, I you know, I wish I had settled down closer to family, or in some cases, I you know I wish I hadn't settled this close to my family. <laughs> Um, you know, I wish I, I at least they, they're at least a half hour away instead of 15 minutes. I'm banging down my door every day, but so I think you guys get the point there. Uh, as I mentioned before, considering ownership costs, um, oftentimes farmers don't consider every cost that goes into owning land. So this would be specific to to those out in our audience here that are looking to purchase land, um, and we'll talk in a little bit about how this applies to if you're leasing land. But for the most part, there are several ownership costs, types of ownership costs. Um, depreciation is when you are um, when something is degrading in value over time, and this this applies to infrastructure on the farm. This does not applied to land. Uh, land is an asset that is um, well known to, to not depreciate. You can't, you can't um, declare in your taxes that your land is, is depreciating. Land generally stays at its, as it, at its present value or appreciates in value, um, whereas barns, fencing, equipment, and other infrastructure tend to depreciate in value. Just over time, they're going to rust and they're going to wear down, and that's considered a cost to whoever's owning that piece of equipment or whoever's owning that, that, that piece of in infrastructure. It's not necessarily a tangible cost. You're not going to be paying someone else for, um, for, the, for depreciation costs. But when it comes time to selling an asset that you own, you're going to be getting a lot less for it over time as it depreciates. Interest, um, commonly amongst agriculture economists, interest is an opportunity cost. So this is, this is not really referring to um, the cost associated with paying down a mortgage. Um, interest, in this case, is referring to the opportunity cost for, for owning land. In other words, if, if, a, if, a, if one of you or a farm owner um, purchases a property for $100,000, you could have used that hundred thousand uh, dollars at the uh, on Wall Street, the stock market, or you could have invested that hundred thousand dollars in a CD, and you would have been been getting three percent interest on that. So that's considered an opportunity cost that you're missing out when you lock up your capital or your hundred thousand dollars in a piece of land. Repairs and maintenance. Um, I've been living by this statement here: everything works great until it breaks. Um, I. <laughs> there, there is definite truth to it, um, and and there's there's a definite cost associated with repairing and maintaining any equipment or infrastructure that you have on the farm. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about that in the, in the following slides. Um, taxes on, on property. Now, this is one of the, the most underestimated ownership costs for for people um, that are new to acquiring land. Uh, they can be the taxes on your property can be significant. It's it's a lot easier these days, or in some cases, assuming you have good credit, or you might have some collateral. It's a lot easier to get financing for a loan to purchase property. But 
the question is whether or not you can pay taxes on that property over the long term. Um, and there are ways to assess your tax hit or your potential tax hit that is going to be associated with a particular property and, there, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And lastly, insurance. Um, again, if, you, if, if you're going to be owning a farm, you're going to need insurance on your property, whether that be casualty insurance or liability insurance in some cases if you're inviting the public onto your farm, um, and those can be considered ownership costs. Is everyone still with me? Is it, um, please use the smiley face. Feel free to use the chat box and enter your questions as they come up. So a little bit more detail about ownership costs. When you're talking about infrastructure equipment and buildings, um, you can use this, this equation that's, that's known as, or this formula that's known as the dirty five. And that's again going back to the previous slide. You can see the D, the I, the R, the T, and the I. Um, it's, this slide just gives formulas to how to assess those exact costs. So if you're looking at depreciation, you're looking at, if you're looking at the uh, depreciation on a tractor, um, the original cost might be $20,000. The salvage value might be $1,000 when it's all said and done, uh, when, you're, when you're ready to sell it. Um, so you, you divide that over its useful life. So you're basically taking the, the, the original cost of the item um, and determining how many years it's going to take for it to lose all its value. And you're breaking down the costs over that many years. And for interest, you're looking at the original costs um, minus the salvage value divided by two. You're basically looking at the, the average value of your investment. Whatever, land, whatever money you're gonna the owner is going to have locked away in the asset, um, you're, you're looking at the average value of that asset over time, and then you're multiplying that by the interest rate that's, you know, the, the going interest rate, um, which, which does fluctuate. Um, but again, this is an opportunity cost. So it, you know, it, it would depend on the, the period that you're looking at. You know, I'm assuming you could take an average interest rate um, to, to determine a, a, an actual opportunity interest cost. For repairs, generally speaking, now the, this, the repairs can be 1% to 2% of the replacement cost for buildings. Now this is based on formulas that, that ag agriculture economists have done all over the nation. Um, they've done surveys of farmers, you know, how much are you spending per year on, on repairing and maintaining buildings, um, you know, and the average has been 1% to 2%. How much have, has, have farmers have been spending per year on repairing and, and maintaining machinery? Average has been about 3 to 5% of costs. Now obviously, your particular situation might differ. And you know, depending on the particular tractor you're looking at or a particular building, repairs and maintenance might not be these actual numbers. Um, but these are the averages. Taxes for buildings, um, you're looking at the property tax rate, which is going to be, be determined at the town level. And you're looking at the assessed value, which again is determined at the, at the town level. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how it is in other states, but towns here in Vermont, they have, each town has their own appraisers and listers that will come out to your property and assess the value. Um, you know, and they'll list it in the grand list of the town, and then they'll tax you based on the, the going rate. And insurance, again, a general formula. You're looking at the replacement cost for buildings, um, the 1%. Of, of that replacement cost is, is generally what you're going to be paying in insurance. And for equipment, again, um, to ensure that equipment, you're looking at the average value uh, times about 1%. So I know that's a little bit complicated um, and might not be applicable to your situation right now, but it's, it's a good thing to keep in mind um, if you do, if it ever does come down to, to figuring the actual ownership costs. Um, and as we'll mention in a few minutes, landowners, if you're looking to lease land, 
landowners will, are going to want to be assessing their actual costs for owning land so they can try to determine a cash rental rate to charge a tenant farmer. So they'll be looking at this formula in detail and it's good to know what uh, a landlord is going to be looking at um, to try to find some middle ground between the number that they determine from this formula and the number that you'll be able to handle through your business or the going market uh, rental rate and we'll talk about that in, in a minute or two getting a little ahead of ourselves here. Hmm. Sorry about... Oh, sorry everyone, I, th I think I hit the wrong key here and went to the end of the slideshow, just bear with me here. So again, um, the Dirty Five formula is one way that landlords can estimate. Now, this is this is relevant to if you're leasing, if a situation if you're looking to lease a property and you're trying to determine a, a, a price to pay per year or per acre uh, for cash rental. Um, the landowners are, might be using this Dirty Five formula to to estimate how much they could they could charge you as as a farmer tenant. And in most cases. All of those ownership costs put together for the for depreciation, interest, repairs, taxes, and insurance, oftentimes all of those costs put together are going to be way more than a farmer can actually pay based on their enterprise plan. So if 100% of these costs cannot be covered by the farmer, what percentage of the cost can be? And that's for you guys to determine. If you are a farmer looking to lease land, um, it is suggested that you determine what you are actually able to pay for cash rent. So this involves the careful estimation of what you are going to be returning from your farm business per acre. And it also involves a careful estimation of what you need to live. What, your, what are your family needs and how much is your family or, your, um, or you yourself spending per month on all of your living expenses? Um, and then you can determine what you're able to pay for cash rent. And so I've, we've outlined a basic formula here. Um, your net, now this is not per acre, but you, you know, this is just generally speaking for the whole deal. Your net returns before your lease payment, this is from your farm business, you know, and, and net returns being your income after all of your expense, all of your other expenses are paid, um, such as fertilizer and such as um, seed and, and whatnot, it's going to be that net return minus the percent that you need to reinvest into your farm operation, that, that you plan to reinvest into your farm operation over time, minus your family needs equals how much is left over that you could afford to pay in, in your total cash lease payment. So these are some, some basic business planning principles that can go into um, figuring out how much you can handle for, for cash rent. Um, and it, and it, it enables you to, to develop a middle ground bef between what you can handle um, or, my, or I should say between what you might want to pay for, for leased land and between that and what a landowner might want to charge you. Um, and then number three there is, is careful examination of cash flow. So you need to know when you'll be able to pay a, a landlord the lease payment. You need to know when cash is going to be available in your particular business cycle. Um, if it's you know if you're going to have a hoard of cash in October after you've you've sold all your produce in September, um, then you know maybe that's the time to schedule your lease payment instead of in in February when there's when cash flow is next to nothing. Uh, again, you can't really overemphasize, as a farmer, you need to know what you're able to handle financially. And in terms of purchase, it goes the same way. Are you able to, to handle the purchase based on your off-farm income, based on the income that you'll gain from the farm enterprise once you do purchase land? Um, and are you able to handle, so between that, your off-farm income, your on-farm income, and your savings, are you able to handle the down payment 
on the purchase of land? Are you able to handle the closing costs? Um, you, are you, if you have a real estate agent involved, you're going to be paying them 3% um, plus or minus. If you have an attorney involved, you might be paying anywhere from $400 to $1,000 in closing costs. Um, you know, and, and you have, and there's other costs associated with getting financing, um, depending on the terms of, of the loan that you might be getting to purchase land. Um, you need to make sure that you can handle all of these costs. And then, and then of course, your monthly mortgage payment based on your income. Um, and can you handle these ownership costs? A lot of times, number two there, the monthly mortgage payment, the banks will make sure that based on your income, you can handle that, that payment um, based on your cash flow from off-farm income or based on the farm business. They're going to they're gonna be reluctant to extend you a loan unless they know that you can handle that payment. But uh, rarely do banks make sure that you're going to be able to handle ownership costs. There, you know, they it, a good loan officer will ask you if you can handle taxes and insurance and repairs and all the equipment and maintenance that you have um, for the farm. So number three is really something for you guys to keep an eye on closely. I mean, you should be keeping an eye on on all of these, but um, number three won't be handed to you on a silver platter. You really be, need to do some research on your own. Some general business planning considerations for leasing. You can get a tax deduction based on, your, on the money you're paying in cash rental per year. Um, that's why it often makes sense to lease land. You're actually um, you're paying less taxes by deducting your, your expense of making your lease payment. And again, you have to time your cash flow for your lease payment schedule. Um, that's important. You need to have cash on hand for other factors that are going to be involved in your leasing land. You're going to be paying liability insurance in most cases if you're leasing. Um, you're, going to, you're going to have to cover minor repairs and regular maintenance. So it's great to know or to plan beforehand to know that you have that cash, cash on hand. And again, for capital improvements, um, this is something that you would could be assessed at the point of, of um, considering which particular improvements that you might be undertaking at a particular property. Um, you need to know if you're going to be making that investment. That's generally a startup cost. If you're, if you're making a capital improvement, you know, it's not considered as, an, as a business expense. But if you're going to be making a significant investment in, in, a, in a capital, let's say you're building a greenhouse on a particular property that you're leasing, or you're um, adding on to a barn, um, it, it pays to know where that money is coming from and what the strategy is going to be for retaining equity in that infrastructure improvement once it is made. In other words, if you're paying for a $20,000 um, barn improvement, um, and if you're leasing that land, what's going to happen when, you, when the lease term expires? How are you going to be recouped for your investment that you've made as, as the farmer tenant? And lease terms, as, as Kathy went over in the last webinar, um, the terms of your lease can specify what, um, what is the formula for determining how the tenant farmer can get repaid for their investment um, and what are the terms that, um, that go along with that. So these are just the five C's of credit. If you, if you do decide to approach uh, the loan of a, a financier for credit in order to purchase a property, um, a conventional loan officer is going to be evaluating your case based on these five criteria. It's easy to remember the five C's of credit. And again, this is for most conventional lenders, whether it be the Farm Service Agency, um, state agricultural credit corporations or commercial banks, they're going to be looking at your character, capital, conditions, collateral, and capacity. Now character, um, lenders will be judging you based on what, you know, how professional you are presenting yourself. They're going to be, for the most part, trying to get a sense of how well you know your business. If you're looking to acquire a farm in order to run a business, 
you need to really know your business well. And so they're going to be asking you questions about how, pertaining to how to try to get a gauge on how well you know your business. Um, for, the mo for the most part, though, lenders use the objective uh, credit score to do, to, as, as a major measure of your character. Um, lenders don't like to make character judgments um, because they, you know, they can get a really bad rep for for not extending a loan based on someone's race or or ethnicity or sex or, or and so on. Um, so lenders do like to use the objective measure of of your credit score when it comes to judging your character um, in the context of whether or not you can handle a loan. Um, so I guess the bottom line there is that if your credit is poor. Um, and, you, and you hope to get a loan, it, it's worthwhile to try to build your credit. Um, and um, I'm, I'm definitely not an expert in where to go to to, to get help with that. Um, I don't know if, Kathy, have you run into that at all? Uh, just general resources where far, that farmers can tap into to help build their credit back. To help build their credit back if they have bad credit? Not, not really. Not any more so than anybody else. Um, here, here in Vermont, we have uh, uh, the Central Vermont Community Action Council, um, various community-based economic development organizations that work with um, with people um, on their taxes. They work with people at counseling, family budgeting. Um, there are various community-based organizations that, that offer free financial counseling um, that you could go to to help build your credit back up um, here in Vermont. I'm not sure about the rest of the, the region here. Um, so moving on to capital, um, lenders are going to need to know that what's on your balance sheet. They're going to need to know that um, do you have assets that exceed the amount that you're that you are um, taking out a loan for. Are you primarily they're going to be looking at, at what kind of debt you have already? Um, do you have do you, do you have too much debt to be taking on more? Um, and that go that ties into capacity. Are you going to have the capacity to actually re repay a loan? Um, and this is based on your income streams, based on your off farm income based on your uh, on-farm income and whether or not you could afford monthly uh, loan repayments. And sometimes um, a lot of the agricultural lend lenders will extend an interest-only loan um, for the first couple of years if they know that your business model is not, is, is not such that it can cover um, principal and interest just to start out. Uh, I know Farm Credit does that across the region. And um, I recently met with an FSA loan officer, and they, they do that as well. So that's something to inquire into. If you don't have the capacity to repay principal and interest, you can get an interest-only loan that will convert into a, a regular term loan or sometimes a balloon payment um, based on your capacity to repay the loan. Conditions is just referring to um, what, what are the, the basic market conditions that surround the type of business that you're, that you're trying to, to start. Um, you know, does it make sense to grow bananas in the Northeast? If you go to the loan officer and you want to have a banana and papaya operation, are they going to extend you a loan for that? Are the conditions right for that? Um, maybe not, or maybe you have a secret that you that no one knows about yet. Um, I think there's a lot of potential, for example, to grow fish in greenhouses here in the Northeast. Um, I'm not sure. How crazy I'd sound if I took that idea to a loan officer, but um, but I guess if you could prove that conditions are such that allow for fish culture in greenhouses and that you've really done your research, um, again, kind of tying back to the character issue, then then you'll get good marks for the for the conditions aspect. And collateral, you you're going to need to, you know, most loans for um, from conventional lenders are securitized, meaning that you you must put up collateral to guarantee the loan. If, 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 any, if you have to default on a loan, the bank um, has right to, uh, to, to liquefy your assets um, and use that to repay the loan. So they're going to be looking at, you know, again, what, what kind of capital do you have? Do you already have, own real estate? Do you already own assets? Do you already own livestock? 
um, and what is saleable? What what is the, the what are the um, the liquidity or replacement costs for each of the assets that you own, or what are what are the values um, rather for each of the assets that you own, and and could they be repossessed and sold um, in order for the bank or the lender to recoup um, the the investment that, that that they've made in you in the form of a loan. So we're on to the second part of this webinar. Um, and take a 30 second break to stretch. If anyone would like to grab a fresh, uh, some fresh air or, or stretch a little bit, now's the time. And there was a question earlier. Um, I'm just going to get back to that. Just about um, when you were talking about uh, the percent reinvested into the farm um, being part of the calculation for what you can afford. Um, wondering if that shouldn't just be part of the general farm budget so that your net returns would have already accounted for that. Um, that was a ways back. I don't know if you can address that um, or would that you know investment actually be um, something that the landowner would be um, you know deducting for your lease because you're you know investing in improving their land or their infrastructure for that matter I'm sorry Jesse could you rephrase that question Sure, because that was a little lengthy, but um, if you scroll back in the chat box, there was a question um, from Susan Peters about the percent uh, reinvested into the farm operations. Um, you were saying that that should be uh, subtracted um, when people are trying to figure out how much they can afford uh, to pay in the lease, and it looks like Susan was just wondering, shouldn't that you know reinvestment into the farm already be part of your farm budget and already included so that your net returns would reflect that. Um, I think she was looking, questioning why that wasn't already, you know, incorporated when you're figuring out your, your net uh, returns from the farm. Yeah, it's, it, it's the same general concept. I mean, the, the, your, your, net, your net income from your farm operation is going to be revenues minus expenses. So that's the only reason why I, I separated those two. You know, ex the the amount the the money that you're going to take after all expenses are paid and reinvest into your farm operation is not usually considered an expense. That's the only reason I I um, I separated it out. Um, it's it's good. It's it's great for farmers to think about income reinvested into their farm operation as an actual expense and, and have a regular habit of reinvesting income into their farm business. Um, but it's, you know, it's generally perceived as something that happens after you've figured for your fixed and operating expenses of the farm business. So it's... Right, so this um, is beyond just, you know, maintenance and, and doing what you need to do to get your, your crop um, to market. This is reinvestment that, that's going to improve, um, improve the land or infrastructure. Um, so, and I guess the question is, wouldn't the landowner somehow be um, responsible for that or accounting for that if you're actually improving their property? Sure. If 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 you are actually improving their property, then you um, then it's definitely not a cost. So. Um, it would be factored into into that kind of equation a little bit differently. Um, you know, if you can somehow value the improvement that you're making, um, you can definitely deduct that from um, a, a cash rental payment that you're negotiating. Is, Kathy, can I just um, make a comment on that? It's, I think it depends on the nature of the agreement between the landlord and the tenant. If you're making an improvement that the landlord is not willing to accept a shared um, cost or the residual value of it, then it would be your 
expense and you could depreciate it or whatever. And I'm not a business person, but in terms of the the nature of the relationship between the landlord and the tenant, that would be true. On the other hand, a landlord might be willing to um, either share in the cost of it or um, assign the, your cost, uh, as Ben was saying, it, uh, take that into consideration when the lease fee is being calculated. So it wouldn't be automatically one way or the other, I don't think. Okay, I'm signing off. Yeah, and, and uh, thanks, Kathy. Uh, and you know, these these formulas that we're using um, and these methods that that can be used to to determine a cash rental rate are not are not always set in stone. Um, they're really just uh, references for for both landowners and farmers to use to um, reference points to use in the negotiation process of determining a fair rental rate. Um, it really depends on the priorities of both the landowner and the farmer and the needs of both the, f the farmer and the landowner um, to determine an actual um, working cash rental rate. And we, 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 t we went over this in the last webinar. I'm not sure if we want to take time to go through that again, um, the various ways to determine a cash rental rate. I know it's a popular question, so um, if we if anyone wants to speak up, um, if they'd like to um, go over that again, please let me know, or else we'll just go through the next set of slides. And I'm I'm just scrolling through the chat box here. I'm sorry, I haven't. Um, And just catch up here for another minute. Dance break. Good. I'm glad someone was dancing. And we definitely can get copies of the slides. Is that right, Jesse? Um, do you want to address that question? Will you be sending out a follow-up email to everyone here for a link to the to the recording of this presentation, or? Um, I'm not sure if you send out the actual PowerPoint slides to participants. Okay. Um, so proper. So when you're assessing a particular, let's say you have gone through all the the preparedness concepts, and you're you're ready to really home in and, and look at particular uh, parcels of land. Whether you're leasing, whether you, you plan to purchase, um, or whether you, you plan to get onto the land in any of the other ways that Kathy mentioned in the last uh, webinar. So there are basic things to look at. You want to be looking at natural features of the land. Um, and you can really get into depth uh, into, and some science into looking at the, at the natural features that exist. Um, it's really a, a fascinating discipline. Um, you want to take a close look at wh whatever infrastructure exists. You want to take a close look at whatever barns exist or whatever fencing exists or whatever equipment that might be available to you um, to assess what needs to, to go into that. What, what kind of repairs and maintenance, what kind of major overhauls need to go into that. Um, what are the costs? You know, we talked about this already. What are the costs that are going to be associated with owning or, or using that piece of equipment or infrastructure? Um, the financial considerations, we'll talk a little bit more about taxes and how to assess taxes on a particular property, where to go to do that, and some of the other considerations involved in that. And we'll also talk about community and surroundings. So as you probably all know, there are lots of natural variations in, in, farm, uh, in farmland, uh, in land in general. Um, these are just some of them on the list. Um, soils is a huge one, and we'll talk about that, um, how you can assess soils. We'll go on a little web tour if, if, that, um, if that works for you guys uh, in a minute here. Um, topography, microclimates is often underestimated. What's, what, are, what are the different hardiness zones? This ties into climate. Um, 
you need to know what what hardiness zone you're looking in. What um, what if you if you're planning doing vegetables or fruit trees or, or other crops, what what hardiness zones can they be grown in? Um, but within each hardiness zone, there's going to be microclimates. Are you on a south-facing slope that's going to that's going to warm up first in the spring? Um, if you're growing fruit trees, that might have implications for frost for um, having your flowers and your fruit trees be susceptible to frostbite because everything thaws out on the south-facing hillside first, but then you get one or two freak freezes and then all your flowers are gone. Um, you know, you really want to look at the topography and how they tie into microclimates. Water is huge. What, how, you know, if water, if water does not exist, it maybe not, might not be a parcel that's worth looking at, or at least if it does not exist, what are the costs that are, that are that you might have to take on in drilling a well uh, or in gaining access to water from other sources. Um, there's a lot that can be done with spring development. Um, and I've gotten this question a lot lately. Uh, uh, a, far, a piece of farmland can have a seep on a hillside, and that can be your water source. But you do need to assess what, what needs to be done. To that. If, is it feasible to develop a spring out of that water source? Can you dig a trench on the uh, on, on the hillside there and funnel more water into a reservoir. Um, Natural Resource Conservation Service is an excellent resource. Um, they have plans and schematics for how you can go about doing that. And you might be able to get, you might be able to consult with um, an NRCS specialist in your state or your county who might be able to come out to the, to the farm that you're looking at um, and assess how water resources can be conserved, how flow of spring can be of, of springs there can be increased, um, how you might be able to tap into river resources, and um, you know enable yourself to be independent from town or village water, and uh, and utilize the water that exists on site. Vegetation, um, a, a big question or a common question is. Is it is it feasible to clear forest? Um, you know, we have we have really cheap forest land that uh, that's available. You know, we, we, this this land is being sold for next to nothing, and, and if we buy that land, we can just clear the forests. And um, that I am not a forester. I'm not a logger. So um, the the actual costs associated with clearing forest and the actual impacts of clearing forest. Um, would depend on you know, what's there to begin with. But generally speaking, I tell people that uh, it's often not cost effective to clear forests that exist. It's the, the money that you're going to save in, in the purchase price of land is not going to surpass um, what you're going to spend in clearing forests and the, and the environmental degradation that's going to ensue from you uh, clearing a particular piece of property. And then again, it depends on your timeline. If you're if you're doing if you're talking about a short-term lease, it's often I, I haven't haven't come across any cases where it's really worth it to clear forests uh, to enable cropping. But if you do have a longer-term horizon, it might be feasible to do that uh, little by little. More about soils. Um, can you guys see my arrow here? I don't, maybe I can use this thing here. Um, you can see my little wand here. Um, we're looking at soil profiles, and we're looking what exists underneath the surface of the soil. You're going to be, if you're going out to assess a particular property, you're going to be walking the land, and oh, no slide or wand visible. Hmm. Um, is there anyone that that can see my wand here? Can anyone else see my wand? Hey Ben, to use that, you actually um, need to click. Um, it'll put a oh. there you go, a dot, and that's going to move okay. every time you click to a new spot. Okay. Well, that's the surface of the soil we're looking at, um, and this is the 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 depth of the soil. This is about we're looking at about two feet underneath the surface right here at that dot maybe about three feet right underneath there. Um, and obviously, if you're standing right here, you might not be able to, to understand what exists right here. Um, I do suggest that if you're, if you're seriously considering 
owning or leasing a piece of property that you obtain permission from the owner um, before you before you start probing into soil, but you do take the time and energy to probe down into the soil, whether that be digging a small ditch with a shovel, um, whether that be using some of the tools that are shown here. This is a, a small two-foot soil probe that can be used for taking tiny little cores, you know, about the size of your, your, your thumb. Um, you can get small soil cores if you, if you probe down about a foot or two. This is a bucket auger. Um, and this can be used for probing down about five or six feet, depending on the, the length of the handle here. Uh, and a lot of times, university, land grant universities have these. Um, NRCS soil scientists have these. They, they might be able to come out um, to your site. It costs about $150 to, to $300. This, this um, bucket auger is, is a lot more expensive than this. This piece of equipment here is about $30. Um, that can be used, and, and of course a garden shovel works. Um, but you want to obtain permission to be able to look at, at the soils that you might be dealing with. This soil here is going to have um, tremendously different implications using this soil than this one. This, this here is, uh, is known as an entosol. It's a very young soil. It's, it's extremely nutrient deficient. It's, it's extremely sandy. It might be great for some uses if you can amend enough nutrients. Um, but because it is well drained, this soil, on the other hand, is is uh, I think it's a picture from the Midwest, the breadbasket region, where it's a you know, it's a tremendously ver uh, fertile soil. This is probably what you're going to be seeing more in the Northeast and New England um, areas. It's a, it's a little bit younger of a soil. Um, it's going to be a, a probably a lot more sandy than you than you'd find out in the Midwest. Um, but oftentimes you do find this. Soil on the right side is um, is, a, is a you can see the cracks down the middle here is due to the high clay content, and um, you know this is going to be a tremendously clay, so a tremendously heavy soil that's going to be um, very hard to work, especially in the spring. So it really pays to dig down from the surface, get to feel the soils that you'd be working with, um, get to know them a little better, and don't let your soils be a secret. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about assessing soils. Um, you can use the online web soil survey as a tool for assessing site soils. And uh, we'll try to launch a little um, web tour here and see if this works. Hmm. Bear with me for a second here. Okay. Mm. So Please um, indicate with the smiley faces if you can see this page, the USDA NRCS. So you see it, Jessica. So, so great. You, you guys can see this. Um, this is a tremendously useful tool that's offered by the United States Department of Agriculture and Natural Resource Conservation Service. And what the Natural Resource Conservation Service has done all over the nation is that they've surveyed soils. Um, I'm sorry that some of you can't see this. Um, hopefully, we can get that resolved soon. We um, so they've surveyed soils all over the nation. Um, they they did this back in the '60s when there was a, a big effort. As I think it was the Civilian Conservation Corps or some big federal program um, that enabled soil scientists to go out all over the nation and catalog soils. Um, and since then, the, the surveys have gotten more detailed, and, um, and they've become digitized, which is a great advantage for us um, online users. You can go into, uh, into the web soil survey, you click on this green button here, um, 
Let me try this. So, I you know I've tried this before over webinar. It's it's tough to 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 go through this. Um, but you can click on the state where you're where you're in. You can use the um, the navigation tools over on the left to enter your address. And what you do first is you enter your address, your area of interest, which means you're basically. I'm sorry, I can't display this over the webinar, but you're basically. The, uh, once you type in an address or location, it'll give you an aerial map, and you can draw a rectangle using this first um, screen here. You can draw a rectangle or a shape over the area where you're looking to to assess as the as the property you're interested in, and then within that rectangle, it will divide up the different soil types, um, and you can then investigate the soil types that exist there. You can click on the tabs here. Um, you can click on the soil map, and again, I'm sorry, I can't do that. But you can you can click on the soil data explorer to learn a lot more about the potential for the particular soils that are on site there. Um, if you know the series name, let me try to launch another web tour here. Um, For the sake of time, I'm not going to get into um, the nitty-gritty of soil series. Um, but basically, if you could, every soil series has an every soil type, down to the most detailed classification, has a series name associated with it. Um, you know, and they're conventional names based on geography. It might be the the state bird or something like that is the name of the soil. Um, you know, it might be the town name where the soils predominantly exist. But you, once you have that soil series name. You can enter it. Um, you, you can do an, an. You go to the NRCS Natural Resource Conservation Service website, and you you can do a search there for um, for for soil series description, and you can enter in the soil series name and get a full description of the soil um, and how it acts, what kind of drainage it has, um, what kind of crops grow there in a, in the native habitat. And all kinds of other other factors, you know, how deep the soil is to bedrock and to water table, what kind of soil is is it? Is it a sandy soil? Is it clay soil? Is it predominated by silt? Um, you can really learn a ton from knowing what soil series exists in the particular parcels that you're interested in. Um, and again, you can do some detailed probing, um, and again, have permission before you do this, and try to cover up um, the holes that you've dug. Um, for building purposes, if you are looking to lease or own land, um, and you and you know that you might need buildings, most states have permitting requirements for erecting buildings, for for making new, for for building uh, dwellings, especially. Um, and the permits usually relate to what kind of septic systems or what kind of wastewater disposal systems are going to need to be installed on site according to the regulations um, that each state has. So in Vermont here, it's, it's the Department of Environmental Conservation Wastewater Management Division that handles those permitting regulations. Um, and there's, you know, it's in, in all of these states, it's these are laws that have been passed. So this is public information. You can kind of dig into the law that was passed related to um, the requirements that are needed to install a septic system. And you can say, OK, if I want to put a one bedroom house, I'm going to need to build this size septic system. That's all, that's all been written into law at one time or another. Um, and then the states have various permitting processes to, in order to, for the state to give the go ahead for you to build or not. Um, but it really all depends on soils. So. The, uh, the particular soils that exist on site are going to determine the potential for building, uh, potential for, for installing a, a septic system or a, a potable water supply system. Um, so oftentimes, if you're looking to purchase, if you're set to purchase land, the, before you actually sign a contract, or you'll sign a purchase and sales agreement, which is a contract that says you're going to purchase the property based on the contingency that the site passes a percolation test um, based on the on the soils that exist there. So that's you know that's often a condition that will exist within your your purchase contract, um, and it's and it's generally not wise 
to to purchase a property if you don't know that it's going to percolate, that it's going to pass these certain tests that are going to allow you for building. In some cases, you might not care at all. You might not have, you, you might not really care about building or, or the potential to do so. In that case, this does not apply. There are other ways to assess various natural features or properties. Um, in Vermont, we have a, a service that's it's an online service that's run by the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, I'm not sure if if other states have this kind of service, but um, you you're able to get online and search through all of these. If you, if you have a particular property in mind, you're you're able to to go through all of these variables um, and learn more about your particular property. Again, there'll be an aerial map associated with it with your search. Um, and you can have different layers and, and, and determine whether or not stormwater permits are needed, if the areas have been uh, demarcated as wildlife habitat or not, if there's sensitive wetlands there, um, if there's legal permits that have been issued according to environmental uses. Um, all kinds of things can be learned about properties by using that service. Uh, again, you want to assess the quality of infrastructure that you're going to be dealing with, um, whether, you know, how much are you going to be, how, how much do you estimate putting into repairing and maintaining all the equipment that you're about to acquire or, or make use of or all the buildings that you're about to inhabit or use as storage sheds, what, what are you going to have to do? What, what's, what are you going to have to build there? What kind of roof are you going to have to repair? Um, and, and, you know, what's, what are the repairs and maintenance, and how can they be distinguished from the major overhauls and upgrades that need to happen? Um, you know, this is important, uh, especially if you're developing a lease agreement, um, to to agree with with the landowner um, what is considered a major overhaul versus a routine maintenance. Uh, most commonly, the farmer tenant is expected to handle routine and cover the cost of routine maintenance and repairs. Whereas if it's a major overhaul that's going to considerably alter the value of, a, of an asset, um, if, it's, you know, if it's a major repair, you're, you're replacing an engine in a tractor or something that's going to really um, increase the value of that tractor by $3,000. It's, 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 it's obviously a major overhaul. Um, the landowners usually um, are expected to cover that cost unless you have a, a specific agreement otherwise. Um, so. A lot of times it's obvious, but the bottom line is that a lot of times it's not, and it's really worthwhile to have a conversation about what is maintenance, what, what needs to be repaired, and what needs to be overhauled in a major way. And again, there, there are some permitting issues involved in major construction. If you are uh, building a road, for instance, to access a particular property, you might need to, to look into the town permitting regulations. Um, there might be state permits involved in disturbing a certain amount of soil. Um, in Vermont, for example, if you disturb more than one acre of soil um, with a development, you need a special permit. You need an Act 250. You need to go through um, an, an Act 250 permit um, with sediment and, and erosion control plans in place. So back to the tax issue. Um, and this might sound repetitive, but again, it's extremely important to assess what are the taxes you're going to be paying on a particular parcel. Um, and this speaks to if you're purchasing um, a little bit more than if you are, are leasing. Um, again, going back a few slides, you, get, you can get a tax deduction if you're leasing land. If, you're, if you own land, you're going to be paying a lot of taxes. And uh, again, a, a Vermont-based example, um, there is a special program here that allows farmers, in certain cases, to get a, a significant tax benefit if they are actively farming. Um, it, here in Vermont, it's called the Vermont Use Value Appraisal Program, and you can get information about that at the, at the Vermont State Department of Taxes. Um, as you can get information at the various State Department of Taxes, um, wherever you're from or wherever you, you're, you're looking at properties, um, and at the Department of Taxes, you'll find eligibility requirements for getting into these tax benefit programs. For example, in Vermont, if you're going to enroll agricultural land, 
that land has to be producing $2,000 worth of income for, or, sorry, gross revenue for the farmer uh, per year. Once, once the farmer on that land is making more than $2,000 a year from agricultural products, you, um, the land can be enrolled in a tax benefit program. That means the town is not going to be able to assess that land at fair market value for taxes. Um, here, land is often assessed at about 10 to 20 percent of fair market value for tax purposes. That's, you know, that's a significant savings to get into these tax benefit programs. Um, for forest land, another example here in Vermont, you need more than 25 acres of, continu of contiguous forest land um, in order for you to enroll that land in the tax benefit program. Farm buildings can be assessed at 0% tax value. Um, it, again, it all depends on the particular program um, where you reside or where you're looking. And there is potential for housing for farm employees to be um, taxed at 0% base. In other words, housing for farm employees is not taxed if it's enrolled in the tax benefit program. Um, and this, this is, for example, here in Vermont, this is special to or specific to um, where there's an employer and employee relationship. Um, this would not apply f uh, for a tenant, for a farmer who's, who's renting a house on a, on a piece of farmland. If, if you're renting a house that um, and, and you're not a, an employee of a farm, you, you know, that, that house is going to still be taxed at normal um, fair market value. But again, that's a Vermont specific example. Um, I don't know if Kathy knows any more about the other states' programs or if, there are any, if there's any major differences to what I just mentioned. Kathy, are you available? Okay. I'll come back to that. Let's see. The town office is a wealth of information. Um, if you're, if especially if you're talking about taxes, um, you can get at the at the town. You can get the exact map and the exact acreage that the town's going off of for you know what 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 the acreage is of the particular parcel that they're assessing it's not necessarily the actual acreage that exists on a particular parcel for actual acreage you're going to need to have a professional soil or a professional survey done of the land um, but oftentimes the the towns will have estimates of acreage that are very very close to those at uh, those surveyed um, measurements, you know, oftentimes there was a survey that was done 50 years ago uh, or 100 years ago. Um, so the, the amount of acres that the town is taxing might be plus or minus. Um, but you can get all of that information at the town office. You can get um, aerial maps of the properties that you're looking at. That often helps if you're walking properties to understand what kind of patches of pasture exist here and what kind of patches of forest exist there and where are the, exact, are the actual borders. You can get current title information. Um, you know, this is important if you, you know, you need to know that the person you're dealing with actually owns the land. Um, it's not, it, you're not dealing with the uncle or something, and, you know, and, and someone comes home from Florida and, and all of a sudden you're leasing their land and they don't know about it. Um, at the town office you can ascertain that the person who you're dealing with actually has title to the land. Um, and this is something that attorneys will access if they're doing a title search uh, to make sure there aren't any other encumbrances on the land. They'll go through all the town records and really look closely at, uh, at this item. Zoning regulations, um, you can get that information at the town. Um, in a lot of states, there is a right to farm law where agriculture is not zoned against. In other words, um, there, at least in, in Vermont, um, so in, I'm sorry, in, in Vermont, um, there there isn't any zoning regulations that would preclude anyone from farming in any particular location. Um, everyone has a right to farm, assuming that you're not posing a, um, 
a hazard to public health. Um, but there are nuisance laws that can go into effect that um, that farmers should should be aware of. Uh, in other words, even though there's no regulation to um, to prohibit anyone from farming, if the farmer comes into come moves into an area and, and is new there and starts running an operation that it's an, is, is obviously detracting from other bordering properties owners' ability to enjoy the use of their land, um, then the farmer can call, can fall victim to a nuisance lawsuit. Um, so just to address this question here, I've heard many tales of issues with easements and grandfather roads crossing farmland and how to address this area. Um, this is, this is another crucial bit of information that can be accessed at the town office. Um, you definitely need to know if there's any easements whatsoever on a, on a particular property. And you can't, you know, you can't really, if there is an easement on a particular property, that's a legal right for another, for another person to, you know, access, to, if, there, if it's an easement for a road, there, that person is going to have, have legal ability to use that road no matter what. Um, if it's a power company, they're going to have the legal right to own the land that the, that the power lines go through, um, even, if, even though they're running through your land. Um, so I guess the only way to address this area is to have knowledge of the particular um, terms that are associated with that easement, to know exactly how many feet within either side of the power uh, pole, for example, are covered within that easement, and to understand who owns the easement, um, and what attitude they're going to have about you um, acquiring the rest of the property that surrounds that, that area that's um, applicable to the easement. So, um, did, did that answer your question? Um, Nate? Mm. Um, comparable sales data. This is a way to determine the, the fair market value of a, of a particular property. This kind of information, I've been told, is available at the town offices. Um, I'm not, I haven't ever gone to the towns and asked them to see records of, of, uh, of, of recent sales. I'm not sure how far back they keep records. This might be different from town to town. But essentially, real estate agents, when they go to appraise a particular property, this is the kind of, they're, they're going to the town um, records or the state records, and they're, they're accessing this kind of data um, to to determine a fair market value for a particular property. They're basing that fair market value on the sales, the sale prices of comparable properties in the area. Um, and I've been told that this is something you can do on your own, um, although I'm not sure, again, it would probably depend on t from town to town what kind of data is available and how it's available. Um, but this is you know, essentially something that a real estate agent would do, um, which is a another not so bad idea if you are looking to purchase a piece of property to get a real estate agent of yours on board to represent you so they can, you know, they're going to be the experts at determining the fair price to pay for a, a particular property. Um, it's hard to go in alone. I know the tendency is to be reluctant to pay 3% in a commission um, just to have a real estate agent um, help you through some listings that you could access on your own, but sometimes it pays. Um, especially if the real estate agent can really confirm the the fair price that could that can be paid for a particular property that may might be a lot less than you would ordinarily pay if you were trying to determine that fair market value on your own so are there any other questions before i I move on i um are there any that I have not addressed? Yeah, I think um, we're going to be wrapping up in about 10 minutes here. Um, 8.30 is our 
cut off time. I appreciate everyone bearing with us up to now. I hope that um, you're getting something out of this. Uh, this is um, a great thing to to not be shy about. If you're trying to assess a particular property, it's it, uh, don't be shy to talk with neighbors and 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 um, and people who have been who know the land, who have, who have been hunting on a p particular property for for ages, throughout generations, who really know the the ins and outs on how a property acts. Um, Uh, over time, you know, throughout the seasons, all the people who live right around your neighbors there, or, or people with that kind of local knowledge, exist, and uh, you know, it's really um, a great thing to be able to talk with them if they're willing. Um, so, just to jump back here a little bit, can tax records, Dave, to be used to assess potential value of a property? Um, they could if you knew the tax rate for a particular town. Um, the, at least the town listers are going to have the, the value of a property that they have assessed. The, um, you know, it might, it's, it's, it's probably easier, in other words, to go directly to the town lister and figure out what is the value of the land that they're basing the tax on, because um, they have assessed the property and they have assessed the fair market value of the property at some time or another. It might have been seven years ago. Um, it might have been just last year, and that's something you need to ask. So. Um, in other words, the, the value that the real estate um, listers at the town level who work for the town office have, have appraised might not be the actual fair market value of the land. Um, the landowner might be able to get a lot more for that right now based on the market conditions or, or it might be even le you know, less value depending on the situation. Um, but at least you can use that, that basic list value that the, uh, that the um, appraisers at the town level have used. Um, and if you're savvy, you can use the tax formulas to 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 arrive at that figure as well. Um, there are resources for help um, in filing for current use status um, in Vermont, at least. It's the county foresters who are that resource. The county foresters' job is to administer. Um, and check up on all of the current use management plans. So when you when someone does enroll into a tax benefit program, they usually submit a management plan that states how they're going to manage the forest for productivity and how that you know what they're doing the ag land and so on. And here in Vermont, it's the county foresters that that have files on all the properties and manage that information. From time to time, they'll actually visit properties and check up on whether management plans are being enforced. So the county foresters can really walk you through what it takes to enroll. In current use, uh, they might be able to help you figure out whether uh, figure out whether or not you're eligible, and then the, the county foresters will refer you to consulting foresters, and these are consulting um, land use planners. They're you know they're they're not always just foresters, but they have experience in um, helping people enroll in the current use plans. Um, the Vermont Woodlands Association has certified forester consultants. Um, you know, most towns have someone, or, or most areas have someone that's experienced in consulting with private landowners on um, whether or not they're eligible for current use. Um, and I'm assuming the same case in other states. Um, yeah, the, the the main goal of these tax benefit programs is to keep the land open and productive. So there is, if it's not private consulting foresters, it's going to be some other agricultural service provider organization that can assist you and support you as a landowner whose will it is to keep the land open and productive. Uh, you know, that might be a state agency of agriculture. Um, it might be a cooperative extension service. Um, you know, I can definitely help anyone. That's something that I, I do. I, I, I know the, the basic ins and outs of, of the Vermont current use program. I consult with, with farmers and landowners. Um, so I'd be happy to talk with anyone here about that at any time. So again, back to community, um, don't, be, don't be afraid to partner, or sorry, don't be afraid to um, talk with current tenants, but at the same time be sensitive that they are not always um, obligated to share information with you. 
you have to be sensitive to the fact that if you're looking to lease land, if there's a current tenant there already, that tenant might not know that the landowner wants to lease land to you, um, you know, and, and maybe not lease as much land to the current tenant as, as before. You have to be sensitive to that fact when you approach current tenants um, and, and, you know, it's just a, approach the, the, the matter with some respect um, and humility. Um, and, you know, and, and I, I think it's, it's always good to ask the landowner or the tenants um, if it would be okay to, to access records or, or talk with them from time to time. Um, so we're running out of time here. Um, I'll just sift through this quickly. Here's another resource that's available um, at UVM Extension's new farmer project. This is going through various considerations. Um, this is a checklist that's similar to the one that we brought up earlier that's in holding ground. Um, and it goes through all detailed considerations in assessing properties. Um, here are some additional resources. These are organizations you can go to if you have any other questions about any of the topics that were covered in either of these two webinars. Um, this is specific to Vermont. Intervale Center here is in, in Chittenden County. Land for Good has an associate, uh, Mike Gia, who works out of Wyndham County um, in Vermont. He's all over the state here. Um, but Land for Good is generally a, a, a New England-based organization. Um, you know, Kathy, you, maybe you can speak to a little bit more about what you guys offer. Because um, I have you guys also, also on this last slide here. Uh, again, Land for Good is a tremendous resource. They're based in the New England states. Um, I don't know, Kathy, if you work throughout New York um, as well, but Northeast Beginning Farmers Project is out of Cornell University Extension. Um, they're a great resource to go to to learn more about land access and tenure issues. Um, International Farm Transition Network has, list, has organizations that do listing and linking programs all over the nation. Um, and then again, we're available here at UVM Extension, um, and there's, there's some other educational resources available in the Land Access Toolshed at this URL here at UVM Extension's New Farmer Project website. Um, so this is Kathy. So Ben, uh, can you hear yeah, me? Thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, Land for Good does have a, a Land Here program, which does focus on helping seekers. Um, we have uh, offer individual consulting, uh, lease drafting. Uh, we help non-farming landowners recruit beginning farmers, so or I mean farm seekers. So that helps on the other end. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, online tools, uh, lease templates, a uh, leasing tutorial, um, a full course on land acquisition will be online pretty soon. Uh, and we serve the six New England states. We do a teeny bit of work in New York, but we're really focusing on um, building our partnerships in, uh, in New England. Thanks, Ben. Well, thanks, Kathy. Uh, with that, we'll adjourn here. Jesse, have you had some more? Yeah, just wanted to say thank you so much, Ben and Kathy, for joining us this evening and for all of you um, uh, who participated. I do want to ask you, um, before you go on to other things, if you can take a minute and uh, fill out this survey. I'm going to send you the link right now. Um, we do really appreciate feedback um, on these webinars and also other things that you might be interested in seeing webinars on and that kind of thing. So uh, you can follow that link. It's just a super quick survey and we'd love your input. So thanks everyone. Thanks Kathy and Ben. And um, we will be sending you some follow-up information if you put your email in the chat box. If you haven't done that already, uh, go ahead and put your email in there. Um, we'll send you a link to the recording of this presentation, also where the PDF of the presentation is, um, and that kind of thing. All right, folks, thanks so much. <laughs>